Hey guys, welcome back. So, since last time, which would have been episode 2, which has very recently gone up for me, you guys have left a lot of really nice comments on the first part. Uh, some helpful ones, some just really nice, so thank you guys for that. In this episode, like I said last time, we're going to work on our tokens, and I don't even know if we're going to get past that to get onto our Lexer, but the first thing, well... I suppose the very first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize some advice and go into here. Now, this is completely optional. You don't really have to do this, but you see here I used a... I just checked if failure was directly null, but we can make this a bit more Kotlin-like, and we can do something more like... Uh, we check if failure is null, and if it isn't, we can then use the let function. And then we can do, we can pad our value here. It, in this case, being failure if failure isn't null. And also, I'm changing up sort of how I'm formatting some of these expressions. I was doing a lot more spaces because that's sort of what I'm familiar with. But when I'm using like a lambda sort of thing like this in an expression, I think I'm going to format it more like a function because that's more sort of what it is, at least to me. So in the case that failure isn't null, we're just going to do what we did before. Otherwise, we want our empty string. So this is just a bit more concise. It might also be a bit less readable depending on your opinion. So you can do whatever you feel is best for you. But I'm just going to replace that personally. And we can head back up the tree. So before we actually make our token class, I think it's a good time to actually talk about documentation a little bit. Now, obviously, with your own language, since it's your language and nobody else knows how it works, I highly recommend creating good and verbose documentation describing how your syntax works. And a part of that documentation is the grammar. So I'm going to be using EBNF, which is just like a format standard. I, technically, I might not even be using it, but basically, there's different ways to display your grammar. I'm going to be doing it differently than I did last time. It's going to look a bit more like this, sort of similar to what you'd see if you look at like Python syntax. Well, their grammar specifically. So if we go back over here, I want to create a new directory and I want to call it docs. And then I'm also just going to make a grammar subset of that because I'm presuming that in the future we're going to have other types of documentation other than just the uh, grammar. Also, I'm actually, I accidentally made a file. You go back in. You can tell I'm uh, new grammar to Vim, that is. All right, and now I can make a file, and I'll just call this expressions.ebnf. Grammar is sort of split, if we come back here, between a handful of things. Things like expressions, declarations, statements, uh, tokens, for example. There's different types of tokens. If you want to go in depth about like what a number is or what an identifier is, that's a good thing to do, and that would be sort of its own file. Right now, we're basically just going to talk about the expressions. I also do kind of recommend using a shorthand, just a little bit, nothing crazy. So like expr for expression, so you're not you're you don't have to type expression like a ton of times because that's something you're going to have to type a lot of. Now, this over here is the sum of the grammar for my programming language C. And for now, we're just going to do like a small subset of this and we'll slowly expand into it. I think what we should start with is like the really obvious thing. So arithmetic and bitwise expressions. And I'm just formatting it sort of like this using a bunch of these... Uh, or brackets, I suppose, for every line that we use. And you don't necessarily need to. You could do something like this, but I just find that this formatting is more readable than things I've done in the past. So I suppose let's just work on this then. By default, an expression is just a bitwise or expression. And so when you're designing your own language, I really recommend just go on Google or Bing and just search like, Rust grammar, or Python grammar, or Java grammar, 
and just look at their structures and get inspired for things that you want in your language. It's also important to note that the grammar is where your order of operations is going to live. So notice the reason that this is all separated this way on the right side. We start with from the top down, it is the lowest priority and the priority grows as we go down. That's why, for example, in the additive expression, we have plus and minus in here because they're the same priority. It's just done left to right. But both plus and minus have a lower priority than any of the multiplicative operations. So you can make your own custom order of operations, and that's going to live in this grammar. And so this grammar file is going to be useful for other people when they're looking at how your language works. But it's also just a useful tool for you to actually design your language before you have to go and program it. We can then define bitwise or expressions as bitwise X or expression. And of course, there's going to be a lot of this sort of typing things that don't exist yet, but that's okay. Then we're using this sort of like regular expression syntax to mean that whatever is in this square braces is optional, meaning this or expression might simply return an X or expression, or it might be an X or expression plus the next things. Now the um, like string syntax here with the quotes is just to say that this is like a literal symbol that's in there, not something that expands the way that these expressions do. These expressions aren't literally the symbols you see, whereas these are literally the symbols inside of there. And so optionally, we can then recursively refer to our or expressions. And this allows us to do something like this, where we could have five or six or seven. And this grammar is valid because the thing on the right, if I highlight, this itself is a bitwise or expression. And so because we define our grammar recursively, we can have expressions like that, which is ideal in most situations. Then we can have a bitwise XOR expression. Now, usually, um, this is very similar to before. Usually, it would be the caret symbol for XOR. Personally, in my language, I'm using the dollar sign. And let me justify why. Because it's not really good to change things that people are accustomed to. But personally... There's like three main reasons I'm changing this. One, the caret was chosen arbitrarily to begin with. A lot of those symbols were chosen simply because they were like the newest added to a keyboard or whatever was left over. Or and and makes sense, at least because and is literally an ampersand and we're so used to this being an or. And sure, people are used to this being an XOR, but it's also useful because to me, if you're going to have pointers in your language, I think using this as an address operator is better and as like a pointer syntax. So for example, like something like this, right? Um, you make a pointer P, which is a pointer to X, something like that, instead of saying uh, this, because to me, this is arbitrary, even though it's familiar, it's arbitrary. So if I choose to use pointers, which I don't think I will in this, I would rather do that syntax. And lastly, I might have certain operators reserved simply for custom structures that you might implement, for example, if you make a structure and then you give it an operator overload. And I think caret would then be better as an exponential operator, for example. But, you know, those are just the reasons I choose dollar sign. Not to mention, I like the dollar sign symbol because it's very similar to the vertical bar. It's just it's the vertical bar with an S through it, essentially, right? So it's it's like or but it's XOR. So like the symbol sort of matches up with the concept, which I also sort of like, but it's completely up to you. You could make this symbol this if for some reason you felt the desire to do so. If you want to use the caret, feel free. Just know that when I'm referring to XOR, I'm going to be using the dollar signs. And then again, we define it recursively like before. We have a bitwise and expression which actually is going to take a shift expression. You could refer to this as a bitwise shift. The reason I'm calling these ors, xors, and ands bitwise is because we are also going to have logical and, logical or. And in my case, I'm adding a logical xor as well. But so similar to the previous ones, we take the next, essentially the thing on the left is always like the next priority up, whatever the next expression is. 
and you'll see in the future why we're sort of defining it this way but it's essentially just so that if we don't find and if there is no or then we check if there's an xor and if there isn't that we just keep going up until we get all the way down our structure we again recursively define this a shift expression should also be pretty familiar additive expression on the left and now we have our first sort of two things it's either those symbols or where we use this vertical or sign or this and the parentheses just define this as like one thing and i think it's just good to sort of visually separate it and so in the future we're also going to run into issues with this recursive structure but the fact that we're defining it this way actually means we're actually imparting into this definition something extra, which is that our operations go left to right. That's sort of what this is implying here, because you can imagine, well, this bitwise XOR up here, we could just copy paste this whole like definition into this spot and then keep doing that. And we keep growing to the right because we're doing the operation left to right. Well, if we have right to left operations, for example, exponentiation, in something like Python, then you would have to define it slightly differently. Additive expression is, again, going to be pretty familiar. It's just a multiplicative, and then we have the addition or subtraction. Multiplicative expressions. Cast expressions. We'll get there in a moment. And we have our three operations, which is multiplication, um, division, and the remainder operator. If, for example, you wanted to change one of these, you could come in here and be like, well, it should be a keyword and it should be mod instead. That's something I've flirted with in the past, but the benefit of symbols over keywords for operations is that you can do... It's just... It's so much more compact if you're doing you know, expressions like this, the moment you have words involved, it becomes a bit less. And so for specifically mathematical operations, it's super useful to just keep those things as like single symbols, I find. And so here we have a cast expression, which is going to be similar to a Kotlin or a Rust expression using the as keyword. But notice now this is actually going to be done well, this is also sort of done left to right, except um, the issue is the thing that's repeating is on the left. So we have to define this a bit differently. There's different ways to define these in the grammar, but the way I'm doing it is just this. It's either a prefix expression or it is a cast expression followed by as followed by some type. We're not going to define the types yet. But so you see, this is either a prefix expression here or it's a bunch of these and eventually ending in a prefix expression. Let me just scroll down here for a little bit. Now, if we make our prefix expressions, these are usually called unary operations, but they're called unary because they operate on one thing. But the thing is, I, I don't think that's really as important as the fact that they are prefix and that they come before whatever you're talking about, right? So, for example, these are like our unary plus 5 or minus 5 operators, etc. This is where you'd have like your pointer syntax if you were making like a clone of C. So we can have our numeric plus and minuses. And then since I'm not, well, since I'm going to be using the not keyword for logical negation, just like Python, I figure I may as well use the not symbol for bitwise not instead of this symbol for bitwise not you can do whatever you like again you know if you don't like mine that's totally fine you can make whatever language that you want and so there i have an ampersand for like referencing but we're not going to do that yet we can come back later and add that you'll also tend to have postfix expressions and these are things like function calls or array indexing or accessing you see on the right i have a lot of sort of familiar kotlin nullable syntax in mine it's i'm i prefer to call it optional rather than nullable because i don't want to be dealing with null etc but in this case i don't actually think we need any of these yet so i'm just going to 
I'll have this here. Actually. No, I'm not. Plus, I haven't actually done the prefix expressions yet. My bad. Prefix op. Those are the prefix operators, but the expression itself, in this case, I'm just going to jump straight to a primary expression. And just like the cast expression, we have an operator followed by... Actually, it's not just like that. But this is also... This one's actually right to left, though, is... And that's why we have to define it this way. Because if you say um, negative, negative 5, it's that is technically the same as this. You do, the, you do it right to left. And that's just because that's how we're used to these operators working. You can make them work however you feel like. But just remember that if you make them too different, then nobody's going to want to use your language because it's just so hard to keep track of everything. Okay, and next we just have our primary expressions. These are things like numbers, characters, strings. I'm keeping these capital because instead of being something that's like it reduces down, it's like sort of a base unit, if that makes sense of our grammar. It's like, okay, this is a number. And we can define that later, what a number actually is. But for now, we kind of just can understand we've reached the end of our grammar. Do I want characters? It'd probably be good to have characters now. I'm not going to do strings. I don't think I'm going to do identifiers yet. I will do primary keywords. And I'm definitely going to do parentheses expressions. Now, primary keywords. I'm just going to have, like, true and false for now. You could add more. You could add, like, an infinity or something, depending on the type of language you're trying to make. And then for our parentheses expressions, it's kind of what you would expect. And this is kind of the meat of this grammar, sort of to me, where it's like, this is sort of like an atom, right? If we're talking about chemistry, this is like an atom. It's the smallest sort of unit here. But what the parentheses expression allows us to do is it allows us to refer to any expression as the unit, so long as it's surrounded by parentheses, which is exactly what we want. So you see that it's now like, I don't know, it's almost like a permanent loop where we're referring to the biggest thing in one of the smallest things. But I think this is mostly looking good. Now, if there's one thing I want to add... Well, I'm not going to add it to the grammar, but essentially, for testing purposes, I'm going to add like a print operator so that we can just say like print 5 plus 5 and it will actually print that so that we can do testing before we actually have like functions in our language. I do plan on adding that later. And I do plan on adding a lot of other features. But for now, this is basically the grammar that we're going to be working with. Um, maybe I could add, I could probably add the logical statements. Although we can probably, we can add that at a later date. But so, Something that I like that I'm adding to my language is compare expressions, right? So basically every language you're going to have things like one is less than two. Like that's, you need comparison expressions. But something that's really dumb, and I don't know, if you actually like this behavior, let me know. Like, I'd like to hear a good justification for why you like it. But if you've ever tried programming for your first time and you try something like this, right? You're checking, okay, is x less than 1 and less than 3? Or is is x between 1 and 3, for example? Well, in most languages, this is done left to right, and it's actually going to say something like this. And it's going to check, okay, 1 less than x is going to be true or false, and that's going to check if true or false is less than 3. And that's just really stupid, and I really like how Python does it, where 0 is less than x is less than 5 is directly equivalent to like 0 is less than x and x is less than 5, to me that just makes so much more sense and it's more useful because I, I like never find myself, when do you ever want to check if like true or false is less than something or if it's directly equal to something because you're in like a conditional so you don't need to check if it's if true is equal to true or if false equals whatever, right? So to me that's better and of course you can get the other behavior just by using parentheses so it's not like it breaks anything. In the future, when we add comparisons, that's how they're going to work. 
And you see on the right, I also am using keywords just like Python. Personally, I just prefer that, but you can just use like double ampersand and the normal symbols. And you can invent a symbol for XOR. I like the idea of having a logical XOR. It's gonna, it like, it just seems like a nice thing to add to a language. And you also see my conditional expression, which is a ternary operator. I'm using Python's uh, sort of syntax. You could also then, you could use something that's more like my non coalescing expression, something more familiar where it's like condition, then x otherwise y. You know, if that's what you prefer, then feel free. Anyway, I think that's going to be all of our grammar for now. I'll try and remember that these are the things we're doing. It's just the, like, the math and the bitwise stuff. Okay. So now we want to go back out. Let me go into the file that I need to read from. We're going to actually make our token. So if we go into app source main and then go into our main package. We can go into our Lexer file and create a new folder or new file called token. I'd recommend um, some people have said that they prefer to keep all their code like in one big file, and that's totally fine. I would just recommend when it comes to token, the token file, you might want to be a bit more generous with the space you give it because a lot of the grammar is going to end up living here. Like if I go down here, you see that we have all of this which is going to take up a lot of space. So I would just say, before we write this, plan ahead where you want to put this. I'm just shoving it in a companion object. Um, hypothetically, it would be better to use const in this case, but since I'm using sets instead of like primitive types and strings, then I kind of can't. But essentially, a lot of our grammar is going to live here so that we can directly access it in both the lexer and the parser. It's just a very useful way to sort of store things. So we now have our token thing. Instead of doing c.lexer, I'm actually going to do c.grammar for our package. And that's because in the future, all of our nodes and all of our expressions, so all of the expressions we just made are going to have their own sort of class that are going to inherit from a future node class that we're going to build. And all of those are going to be in the c.grammar package and most of them are going to need to talk about tokens, like all the time. So instead of having to import token in every single one of those classes, we can just make them all part of the same package and they can have access to each other that way. And it also conceptually makes sense because the token is part of the grammar, but you can you can uh, manage your packages however you feel is makes the most sense. Now in the future, we're going to need um, kotlinmath.pow. I don't remember why. Um, actually, maybe we don't. I don't think we do. Let me just make sure I'm searching right. Yeah, because I'm pre I move that out of this file. Let's import uh, C faults, and we can also import our source line. We want to create some nice things up here. These could probably be constants. Again, I'm not worried too much about pure optimization. So if you know how to optimize this without breaking it, then be my guest. It's, I love optimized code. But I just want a list of all the uh, uppercase letters and lowercase letters for future use. And I'm just going to use the, what would this be, a range syntax. And I'm going to make a range of characters from capital A to capital Z. And I'm going to join them to, to a string and separate them by nothing. Because it doesn't matter what they're separated by. I don't really care. Well, actually, I do. I want the string to only contain the letters. And then we can do the exact same thing for the uh, lowercase letters. This is the best way I've found to do this in here. In Python, you can, there's like just, you can just import from string. Like, this list is automatically created. But either way, this certainly will function. So now we can construct our token class. It's a data class again. And it's going to take two things in its primary constructor. It's going to take a source line, like we said before. Every token knows which line it comes from. And it's going to have a type. And we haven't defined what type is yet, but that's okay. 
we also want to make sure that this class is a fault component so that we can mark them and then we can actually like see our errors properly. Now for types, right? There's a handful of types and there's different ways to handle this. We have punctuators, which are like all of our operators and like just syntax symbols. We have identifiers, which are like variable names and stuff. A subset of identifiers are the keywords, which are all the identifiers recognized by the language. These would be things like data or class or if or val. And you can define which identifiers are your keywords. Then we have like numbers, characters, strings, and we also have like a none option. In the past, I have separated punctuators from operators, but I don't really think that's useful. It's just, it doesn't really... Like it's it, it exists as separate cons for a conceptual reason rather than actually benefiting the code. It makes the code worse. And conceptually, you really don't even have to separate them. Like it's just not a big deal. So another option you have is instead of making all the tokens take in a type, you could also give each type of token its own class. But I don't I have done that in the past and I just I don't think it's really necessary, at least not the way that I do things. So we're going to make our type enum, which is going to be part of the token class, so things can access it by doing, by saying token.type, which is useful. And we can just give it a label for every single one. And that is so when we print out a token, we can associate the type with the token so that we just have like some useful information. And we can now say uh, like punk, which is going to just be the first letter i'm definitely in the past i've also made these like full but you don't want to type out token dot type dot identifier every time so i i'm just shortening all of these <laughs> a lot but again name things however you think is best rather than doing a one for one with mine but yeah these are all pretty intuitive it's just the first letter of all of them, except our none. I'm choosing to just make it a question mark so that when we print out our tokens, it's going to be something like punctuator like this. Like that's just how I choose to list out the tokens. You can do whatever you like to represent. You could use those or any sort of bracing. But so the question mark is something like if there is no type, because perhaps maybe this token exists purely as an error, then it sort of denotes that. And that's our enum. Alrighty. Now there's a few properties that this is going to need. Like we've said before, a token needs to know its exact, its position in its line. And we can just call um, line.newPosition from before, which is why we made that method. And we also need a string which is the actual symbols that the token contains i'm choosing to make it a variable rather than a value because in the future certain things are going to change the string so it will have to be modifiable you could of course just copy the um the actual token object but i find i'd rather it be mutable personally and then again we can use the new string thing and we can pass in the position that we just got. And that's why we set up the line the way we did. Now there's some very useful things for the parser, which of course we're not going to use yet, but it's good to have it set up here. I like to have of and has methods. So if we have a token, we can ask token dot of, and then we can pass in a type. So like token dot type uh, key. And this just returns uh, true if the token is of this type, or it returns false. The reason this is good is because we can do multiple types in here, because maybe we want multiple things. Because I find in the past that if you're saying token.type is equal to, it can get really messy. The of isn't actually the useful one, really. It's the has, because if you're trying to check has, which is instead of comparing type, it's comparing the string. So you can say like token dot has a new line 
or it has a semicolon, or it has nothing, which is an end of file, then it would return true or false. So these are just super useful. In order to have an arbitrary number of arguments, we're going to have var args. And this is how you do var args in Kotlin. So we just have types, which is of type type. And then we just return, is this thing in the list that you've passed in? Now, another useful thing is it's nice to have an overload of this to take in any collection. So instead of saying like uh, token dot of, I'm just going to do shorthand here, like punk and ID. If this thing is already a list, you don't want to have to separate it out and do conversions. Or if you have a set, because then it's just, it becomes really messy. So it's nice to just have an overload for this as well. And we can just call the previous one. And what you have to do is, similar to Python, you can like use the asterisk to unpack values, but you can only unpack certain things in Kotlin, and one of those things is a typed array. So if you didn't want to have this overload, you'd have to say, unload, you'd have to do this every single time instead of just passing it directly in, which is why I have this overload. Now we have our has as well. For, our, for a bunch of strings of type string, we just again check, is our string in the list of strings? And again, we have our collection of type string as c.2 typed array. And it's also useful to have an is int, I think. I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll end up using this. And all this checks is, is this thing a number? And um, is the decimal point not in the string? So it returns true if this thing is an integer number and it returns false otherwise. Now we should have a two string so we can have some nice printing of these. And we can set it equal to a value here. If the string is empty, that means it's end of file. And we should print it in like a nice way. We can do our type label which in this case will be a P for the punctuator, but it's good to just have, it's good to just not hard code in the P just in case there's other situations. And then we just put in the text end of file. Otherwise, uh, for our generic one, we do the type label, which is why we stored our label in the uh, enum to begin with. Followed by the single quotes, how I like. And then we do string dot replace, and we need to replace new lines with escaped new lines. That way, suppose we had a new line token. What it would have printed otherwise is like this. It would have printed this, but what we want is um, this. So we just have to do that dot replace there to escape the new line. And I think that's our two string done. Now we need to actually override the fault component methods. So we have our field, which is lines, which simply returns um, list of line. Actually, I think I forgot something. <laughs> so I did change something since last time. Let me go into my faults. Because as I was programming, I thought of, I realized I needed to change this. So we have to change our component interface here. Firstly, we need a way to access all of the lines because otherwise when we try and print nodes, it just won't end up actually working. So we need to, every single component needs a field of lines, which is a list of source lines. So we actually have to import um, c.lexer.sourceLine. I don't remember. I hope I didn't make any other changes that I've forgotten about. And I've also just, instead of get marked lines, that doesn't seem very Kotlin-like to me, so I just also made that one a field and just marked lines with a getter. And what we can do is we can take our lines, we can map them, so that we go through every single element in the list and construct a new list. And instead of the list of lines, we want the list of every line's uh, marked line. Okay, that's the other thing I changed. 
So we'll change that in a moment. And then we can say join to string. So it's not a list anymore. So it's an, just a big string. And you see that that's also an error now because I also changed the source line. Because again, just having getters, like having explicit sort of get this thing. Where do we have it? Get mark line. It's just not very Kotlin like to me. You can, of course, keep it the same. You just have to explicitly say that. So instead of a function called get mark line, it's just going to be a field called mark line. Um, I don't think we finished our spoken class. So let me just try and run this. It's probably going to fail. Okay, why? Is it because of the token? Uh, in faults, get mark lines, class token is... So token is a failure, but the faults is also upset. Probably because we refer to this in more than that one place. Let's go back. Yeah. Whoops. Okay. We also have to come down here and instead... Instead of saying C dot get marked lines, we can just say marked lines. Because we changed our component. And so that makes that a tiny bit, uh, like cleaner let's just see it should only be the token thing that's failing token yeah okay now we can go back hopefully that's not too um hopefully that wasn't too big of a jump and now i also have to bring this back to token nice uh if i resave this that goes away so it actually exists and we have to override the tree string as well. And also notice, because we have this lines, I don't actually need to implement get mark lines anymore for our token or our node. So I can just create the list of lines and the interface will do the rest for us. But now our tree string, I would like to use two string for this, but we need to pass in a prefix and call it recursively. So that's why we need to have a tree string. In this case, for tokens, it, the tokens are like the endpoint of the tree string, and we're just going to output the value of our thing to string. But in the future, nodes are going to be calling this, and nodes are going to have both subnodes and tokens, which is why the, the tokens need this itself, because the node doesn't know if a subnode is a node or if it's a token. And that sort of abstraction like ignoring what it actually is is very useful because if you actually had to keep track of that i think it would be a huge pain and lastly we need our mark we can just call on our line uh we can just mark the position this dot line position do i actually have to say this did i just say line position why did i say this that's interesting anyway it's the same thing now we can add properties to the object, to the token class itself, sort of static properties. This might not be the best way to sort of keep track of all this stuff, but... Okay, we don't have postfix operators, but we also, we do have prefix ops. So I'm going to make a set of all of our prefix ops, which is just the plus minus and not. I'm using a set simply because conceptually i don't care if there's duplicates like if if we have duplicates here it just doesn't matter so why should we store them right so it should be a set we're not doing comparisons or assignments yet now we can create so you'll have a bunch of other operators and then we can have the overall punctuators and this is going to be the sum or i guess the union of all of those things previously plus a set of other things and this is where we're going to add the rest of our um, punctuators you could add like a binary operation binary offset but I'm not going to do that I'm just going to put them here so this is multiplication division uh, remainder this is binary add binary minus so like 5 minus 2 instead of like negative 2 you don't have to add this again but because we're using sets, the duplicates are going to be removed, so it doesn't really matter. 
I just want this to be sort of exhaustive to directly reflect the grammar, which is why I'm adding it twice. Uh, and XOR and OR. Um, I don't think we need any of those yet. We should add semicolons as an optional way to end a line, but that's actually it. Now, something I do want to point out when you're designing your own operators. Notice, for instance, I'm using a bit of a Python Rust syntax for functions, which you can't actually tell yet, but that's what the right arrow is going to be for in the future. And this syntax, you have to be careful when you're combining symbols. Because, for example, this is not a big deal, but this is a big deal. And so why is this arrow actually a big problem? If you write 5, 2, maybe you just want your arrow to, maybe you just want that arrow operator, right? Because you like how it looks. How can your compiler differentiate between 5 left arrow 2 and 5 is less than negative 2? right? You could just force people to put in spaces, but that's sort of clunky, right? Because you're, not everybody formats their code the same way. And it's also kind of weird to do that. You can, it's fine. You just have to be explicit that this is different than this. And so you'll run into situations where if your syntax is really strange, you'll have to make sort of rules like that. For example, if you have, I don't know, if you have a unary multiply, like a unary star, if you have a syntax like this, is this like 5 to the power of 2, or is this like 5 times the dereference of 2, or something like that, you know? So you just have to be careful with how you make your operators, so that, firstly, they should be easy for you to parse, they should be easy for your lexer, and they should be easy and make sense for your users. So just consider those things when you're making your own. Um, this is, I already have the end of the set, but I can get rid of that. So these are all of our punctuators that I can think of that we need right now. Just a bitwise stuff plus our uh, end of statement thing. And now what we want. We want to take all of our punctuators, and instead of manually getting track of how all the symbols, we can just program it so that it can get a list of the symbols. Because our lexer operates on symbols, like we said before with our take in our source file. We want to take like sets of symbols, for example. So we need the set of all the symbols that compose all of our punctuators. And instead of doing like, well, it's a plus minus and doing things manually like this, which is a nightmare and hard to maintain, we can we can access all of our punctuators, and then we can map them to something. And I didn't fully understand this before, but now I have a pretty good understanding. So flat map is like map, but it's different, which is kind of a, a stupid statement. So each of our punctuators is a string. And when you call map, our, iter our IT here, our iterable, our it, is that string. So for each of these strings, we can call as iterable. And if we have something like this, this is will produce a list like this of each character. It should actually probably be literally characters. So this is the result of mapping a single string this way if we did map but when you have like multiple strings that's going to produce a list of lists but we don't want that so instead of map we can do a flat map you could think of it as flattening out all of that so we're producing one array of characters that are in our punctuators and then in order to get rid of duplicates we can just convert this to a set and that will just get rid of the duplicates because you'll notice if you have a less than operator you're going to have a duplicate with the uh, left shift operator if you have like a unary plus that's a duplicate with the binary plus etc okay 
I like to have lists of the symbols we need because that's just going to... Once we make the Lexer, you'll see why that's actually so useful. It's an easy way to detect what type of token we should make next. So next we can make the identifier start sims, all the symbols. So why do we have identifier symbols and identifier start symbols? Well, there are some tokens like identifiers that can start that whose symbols are like not uniform in the sense that you, if I do this in Kotlin, right? If I say zero, zero, x y that's a number followed by an identifier but if i say x y zero zero well that's just one identifier so there's certain symbols you can start an identifier with but you can't or there's certain symbols that you can add to the end of an identifier but the first symbol needs to be something different in this case the the, the way you start an identifier is going to be an underscore or some letter and in this case, it's our uppercase plus lowercase letters that we had before. One thing I will say is you will probably want to add support for like Unicode characters. So in a language like C, you can actually use these like Unicode characters as identifier names. And that's really good to allow people to type non-English characters as identifier names. That's probably a good idea. If you want your language to take off, then you should be supporting. You should allow the most people to use it, right? And maybe there's times when it's like super useful. Maybe you want to have like Greek letters as variable names or something, right? You want to have the variable pi represented by the actual symbol pi. Uh, you should also look into languages like Julia, which are really cool. And sort of, I would say LaTeX, but LaTeX is... It's mostly a formatting thing, but yeah, they're all interesting. There's different approaches that you can take. So our identifier symbols are, well, they're obviously the identifier start symbols, but then we can also add on all of our digits because we want to allow digits and numbers in our identifiers, but an identifier cannot start with a number. Hypothetically, you could make a language where your identifiers do start with numbers you would just have to make your lexer smart enough to detect that and it probably wouldn't even be too hard because if you're doing something like this right there's no spaces in here so if you find like an integer followed by identifiers you could just say it's an identifier but is that really something you feel the need to add that's up to you um i just forgot something that was kind of interesting um, I'm trying, I don't think I can really remember. Maybe I'll remember it soon. And then we can have our keywords, which is a set of true and false for now. And you see, I have tons of other keywords and stuff, but for now, that's all of the keywords that we have. Uh, I think, right? Because we're not implementing any of the Boolean ones. Oh, we do need the as keyword though. Because we're going to be doing casting which means i'm going to actually have to implement like a mini well not really eventually we'll have to implement a type system once we start transpiling which i haven't designed yet well i have a design but it's a bad design so i'm trying to redo it but so i think that's it for now there was ugh, there's something i'm trying to like remember about if you make your own sort of syntax for things. I hate that I can't remember this. But otherwise, I think that's everything. At least for this episode, because we're like 50 minutes in already. And we've made our token class. Actually, I just realized after I finished recording, I forgot there's still more to do. Just a little bit. Okay. Um, it's just nice to have like an end of file sort of remap because it, if you see an empty string all over the place, you might forget exactly what you're referring to. So it's nice to just be able to say like token dot end of file. Similarly, we have our line ends, which is the set of uh, all of the things that could potentially end a statement. So semicolons in our case, in this language, we're going to be using new lines 
and the end of file itself. And now we also need numbers. So uh, num start sims, which again, just like before with the identifiers, you can start numbers with certain symbols, but you can't. And then you can have other ones after. So for example, a hexadecimal number, right? You can't start a hexadecimal number with an X, but you can have an X in the number in the future. So initially, I'm starting all my numbers with digits. I'm also allowing us to start with a period because personally, the way I write numbers is something like this. I tend to write things this way. So I want this to be allowed. You'll just have to be careful to deduce, am I talking about a number starting with a decimal or is this the like period operator for accessing things? And then we have a list of numeric symbols, which again is the start symbols. Plus, you'll probably want this, I imagine, but I am going to be doing something really strange. Some of you will find strange. So B for binary numbers, O for octal, and X for hex, hexadecimal. The reason I'm using O, so in C, if you want to write octal numbers, well, actually, if you start a number like this, this is a binary number, this is a hexadecimal number, and this is a octal number any number that starts with a zero is considered octal so we're actually going to have to consider that in the future because in my language i want zero five to just mean the number five if you add the zero it's whatever right i don't care so i'm making it explicit by adding an o as like the octal and i believe rust does this as well um in c you can use like capital or lowercase personally I'd prefer to just keep these lowercase. And that also then means that the actual symbols are going to, for the digits, are going to be uppercase. Another thing a lot of languages do that's nice is they allow you to add underscores inside of numbers just to space them out, but the underscore effectively does nothing. So we're going to do that as well. And if you only want binary octal and hex digits, then you can just place those in here things like, you know, the capital letters A to F. But personally, I'm going to actually implement an arbitrary base system. So what that means is 0B is going to mean binary, 0O is going to mean octal, 0X is going to mean hex. And these are because that's what people are familiar with, and there's no reason for me to not support them. But I'm also going to allow 2B I'm also going to allow, I suppose I should say, 2B to mean binary, 8B to mean um, octal, and 16B to mean hex. So B here in this context means binary. In this context, the B means base. And I, it's not really, I don't love that, but I like my arbitrary base system, and I don't want to get, but I don't want to get rid of these three. So I'm just going to have that there. And it's fine because base 0 makes no sense. You could also have base 1 also mean binary, but uh, I choose to just not. We're, we'll get into this later the next time once I actually make the lexer. But what this allows you to do is you can then do like base 3, base 12, base whatever. Of course, you can use base 10, which is familiar. But the question is why, right? Like, what's the point in allowing that? And while one thing that I'm adding that C itself doesn't support is I don't quote unquote decimals. I don't remember if I talked about this in the previous video, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but you'll be able to say something like 0B1100 period this, and this is going to be the decimal equivalent in binary. It's unfortunate that we call the decimal point the decimal point because we're not always, it, we still have the point even in bases that aren't decimal. I suppose you could call this like the binary point or something. Basically, the floating point. <laughs> um, you'll be able to do that with every base. So, why allow an arbitrary base? Well, there's something really interesting. So, think about rational numbers, right? Like mathematically speaking, fractions, reduced fractions they are not always going to be finite in the representation. 
For example, this is very familiar to us. A third in base 10 is an infinite string of threes after the decimal point. And now that's actually because three is not a factor of 10. So I could get all into bases, but that's going to potentially be another future video. Um, why allow arbitrary bases? Well, consider if we want to write a third, we have a handful of options. We can write 0.333, but then we have to know how precise our language is. We have to know how many of these digits actually matter, right? So that we have the adequate amount of precision. We could write 1 over 3, and we have to make sure one of them is a double, which is actually pretty good because it's pretty readable. But then, how do we know that our... Is our compiler going to be smart enough to optimize this so that this happens at compile time instead of runtime? Because division is, you know, for a primary operation, it's pretty expensive. So it would be nice if we did this operation at compile time rather than at um, runtime. But you're not necessarily guaranteed, depending on your context and your compiler for whatever language you're transpiling to, whether this will be runtime or compile time. And as a secondary option, because that's fundamentally it. I'm not disallowing those previous ones, but I'm just adding another option. You could also write something like this. And you're saying it's base 3.1. And so getting into the base thing I was talking about before, rational numbers will not always be representable with finite digits in any given base. But it is true, at least as far... I haven't proved this mathematically, but maybe I will in the future... Every rational number can be expressed with finite digits in at least one number base. Because think about that, right? Like, what does 1 over 3 mean? Well, it means a third, right? And how do you write a third? Well, if you have a tenth, a tenth is just 0.1 because we're working in base 10. In base n, 1 over n is always 0.1. So if you have some crazy like finite, if you have some crazy infinite rational representation of a number, instead of doing a division, if you want to write it out this way without having some crazy digits, you could do something like this and just say 3b.1 or 0.2 for two thirds or 0.3 for one, for one three thirds. Yeah, like that's, that's just something I've been interested in. I like the idea of a language that supports that. Um, it's not really essential and you don't have to implement it in your language, but in the future we're going to actually add it in and it, maybe you do actually want something like that in your language so you can actually see how I'm planning on doing it. I hope you guys had fun, I suppose, that's a word for this. I hope you find all this interesting and I hope you enjoy like my extra commentary on certain things. I, I'm just trying to be as like informative as I can in this. And if you're skipping around or watching at like two times speed or something, props to you. Good for you. I don't, you know, what, what matters to me is that this series is useful to you. You know, you don't have to take it exactly as I give it out. So long as you find utility in it, that's really what matters. So I hope you guys enjoyed. And then the next episode, we're going to actually begin implementing our Lexer. And even that might end up taking two episodes by itself. But I'll see you guys then.